Today I'm going to be talking about anvils and basically this uh, video is going to be trying to tie up a lot of loose sands and it was basically generated from the first two videos that I produced in this series uh, but more specifically the second one where I actually did the welding on the anvil. So if you haven't seen those two go back and have a look and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Some people wrote in and they were quite concerned about, you know, that I was ruining my anvil because I was going to be taking out the temper and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And there was all this concern about, you know, uh, the condition of the anvil and, you know, shouldn't I try to preserve it and all this kind of stuff. So I want to address all that now because there seems to be an overwhelming majority of people that feel that all anvils have hardened faces. And that is by no means the case. Uh, I've, you know, mentioned before that I've never owned an anvil with a hardened face and I've, you know, the people that taught me didn't have anvils with hardened faces and, and so on. And, uh, and since then other people have written in and said, you know what, you know, mine has a steel plate welded to the top, but it's not hard, you know, and if I miss, you know, I'll dent the surface, but it's certainly stronger than the wrought iron that's underneath it. So, you know, it may seem like a hardened face and over the years it just kind of got confused into being a hardened face, but the vast majority of anvils out there do not have hardened faces. So if we go back to, you know, the history of the anvil, the first anvils that were manufactured uh, were purely wrought iron. They didn't have the technology to put anything else on it. They didn't understand really where, you know, higher carbon steels came from. They just knew when they found it, you know, they had to cherish it, just use it very, very carefully. They certainly weren't going to put a half inch plate on top of a wrought iron anvil. That was just ludicrous. It was like going to the moon for coffee. It's just something that wasn't done. Years later, they developed a technology and they were able to weld a half inch or whatever, you know, a steel plate to the top of a wrought iron anvil. And that greatly increase the durability of that anvil. I might be wrong on this and please correct me if you uh, you know uh, know more about the history of anvils than I do but I think the transition went from wrought iron to wrought iron with a welded steel plate on the top but that plate was not hardened and then from there they went to cast iron anvils that had a steel plate which again wasn't hardened but at least it was a steel plate that was very securely bonded to a, a cast iron base and then from there we went into the cast steel or machined anvils that we have today. Some of the higher priced anvils are, are cast steel or they're machined out of a, a block of tool steel and you know they are heat treated uh, and you know brought to very specific tolerances. So if you consider the whole history of the anvil, which I have represented here by this mechanical pencil, so at this end of the pencil you have the first donning of the anvil as a separate piece of equipment, and it's no longer a rock, they've moved to some form of a metal anvil. And then over here is the transition point from the totally wrought iron anvil to the anvil that we have today and see as the norm, which is the cast steel hardened faced anvil. If I click this mechanical pencil twice, the amount of lead that you have sticking out at the end of this pencil represents the amount of time that we have worked with hardened steel faced anvils, you know, it, during the history of forging. Now, I may have exaggerated a little bit, maybe it's three clicks instead of two, but I'm just trying to make a point here. And the point is, all of the great works that have ever been done right through the heyday of hand forging, which in my opinion is from like about the 11th century through to the 1500s, all of those guys worked on soft anvils and they did not have hardened faces and they produced some of the best work that has ever been produced and they made it through somehow. The hardened steel faced, in my opinion, again I could be wrong on this, but came about when the industrial age came in and they were letting a bunch of people in the shop that really didn't know what they were doing. So they had to develop an anvil that could resist a lot of abuse because they didn't know who was going to be hammering on this thing or with what. So the main advantage of a cast steel anvil is that 
if you hit it with something, chances are whatever you're hitting it with is going to break before the anvil. And it's certainly not going to mark the surface and, you know, it's going to resist a lot of beating. Now having said that, heat treating and tempering is always a delicate balance. You have to find that level of brittleness that you're willing to live with and balance that out with the amount of toughness that you need to keep the tool from failing. So the fault with cast steel anvils in my opinion is that when you have say a smaller anvil and you start working to the outer edges of its limits then you're putting a lot more stress on that anvil than it was designed for. So you know if you're hitting a 80 pound cast steel anvil with an 8 or 10 pound sledge and really working on the corner over time you could start to develop enough stress in that steel plate that it'll start to fracture and you do see anvils that have large chunks just taken out of the corners of them or um, for example the one that I'm working on right now at the museum is has the whole front edge torn off and I have to you know replace that next spring somebody for some reason just start just kept on hammering and hammering on that edge just kept looking for some edge that they can use and just continually started breaking off that edge and that's a 400 pound anvil so somebody was really beating on this thing so even though the hardened steel faced anvil has been around for such a short period of time uh, it's been during our time period basically it's really just the last hundred years or so maybe 150 years that they developed uh, you know the cast steel anvil and started heat treating it and from that we have developed a lot of fixed ideas of what anvils should be and what makes up a good anvil and I think a lot of them are kind of ludicrous so you know the, the main purpose of this video uh, is to sort of give you my opinion and you know sort of a different angle on what people are seeing as the norm and the first thing I'd like you to consider is something that's called the rebound test. If you're not familiar with that, it's where you take a steel ball bearing, generally it's about an inch in diameter, and you drop it from a specific height onto your anvil face, and then the amount that it bounces back up uh, determines the hardness of that face. Now, that test is a real test. I mean, it's normally done with scientific equipment and very controlled environments, but you know, as a field test, dropping a, a ball bearing onto a hardened steel plate will give you, a, you know, a basic estimate of how hard that face is. If the face is harder, it'll bounce back higher. If it's not hard, it'll bounce back lower. And if you're looking for an anvil that has a hard face, you know, that is a valid test. It's, you know, it is a good way to determine whether the face is hard or not. But over time, and again this is very recent history, this has been confused as a test that determines whether that anvil is a good anvil for forging, which of course is crazy. The hardness of that face has absolutely nothing to do with your ability to move metal on that anvil. The theory is kind of, you know, not really based in solid physics. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of intuitive and it seems to sound right, so it's become common sense now. And, and the theory is really uh, basically if you drop the ball bearing and it bounces back to almost its original uh, height, then you have a very hard steel face. and that will also affect your hammering in that uh, if you hammer then all of the energy is going to somehow be bounced back into the metal and uh, will allow you to forge more metal faster. So here I have a ball bearing. It's a lot smaller than the one that they recommend for the test but still it illustrates that the uh, surface of the anvil will allow a ball bearing to bounce around and uh, I'm not going to drop it from the full height because I've already lost four of these and this is my last one. Uh, but I just want to illustrate that this anvil face, even though it's not a hard face, is allowing the ball bearing to bounce. And here's my version of the rebound test that I feel accurately illustrates the effect of the hardened steel face on forging. Now, in my opinion, it's more reasonable to assume that if you have a large chunk of metal that is your anvil and it's not moving, any force that you apply with the hammer to the forging is going to go into that metal. 
you know, you can bounce marbles all you want. I mean, this that's the reality of it. Most people that have problems with their anvils are working on bases that are too flimsy or their anvil isn't secured down tightly or maybe the anvil's too light for the work that they're doing. You know, there's some mechanical reason for why the force isn't being delivered totally into the work. It's certainly not that they're working on an anvil with a softer face. A hard face will increase the durability of that anvil, but it will not increase your ability to forge that metal one bit. So in my opinion, if I'm looking at an anvil and I want to evaluate whether it's worth buying or not, the hardness of the face really doesn't come into play at all, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the condition of the face is important, of course, because you know, that reflects the uh, amount of time or you know, the amount of work that you have to put into it to bring it to where you want it. But whether it's a hardened face or not really doesn't matter. And again, the ex example, of course, that I'm using is the anvil that I'm resurfacing now. When I bought that anvil, uh, the reason I bought it was because it had the proper shape. It had a nice thick waist and, you know, it, there wasn't much overhanging the main waist area. The heel of the anvil was very short and the horn of the anvil was very short. There, a lot of its mass was in the center, the thick waist, and that's what I was looking for. The, total, the, the face was totally blown away. Somebody had just gone crazy with a cutting torch and grinders and God knows what else. So the, so the face was totally gone. I had to totally rebuild that and that's just welding rod. There's nothing else on there. There's maybe 10% of that face that's original. It, it, what, there was a steel plate welded to the surface, but again, it wasn't hardened and I had to rebuild everything else. But I was willing to do that because the shape of the anvil uh, is what I was looking for. You see a lot of anvils that are that London pattern anvil, the very classic anvil shape. If you draw an anvil, that's what everybody draws. It's that long, graceful look. And they are beautiful anvils, there's no question about it. I drove several thousand miles going to auctions and <laughs> trying to find my first anvil, and it had to be that shape. And then when I got it home, I was disappointed with it. I just didn't like it. And then um, I was able to transition from that into this... Uh, another anvil that a friend of mine loaned me and it was one of these dumpy little thick waisted anvils and it was great. It weighed only 10 pounds more than my London pattern anvil but the amount of work that I was able to do on that anvil was just tremendous. It was, it was, it was like the anvil weighed 100 pounds more than it actually did so that was a real eye opener for me. So ever since then I've ditched the London pattern and I've gone to you know the shorter squatter uh, anvils that have more of a base and a thick waist and less of a horn and less of a heel. I want the mass over the center of the base of the anvil. And finally today I want to address the problem of retempering an anvil. A lot of people have suggested that maybe I should do that or if that was an option. And I, in my opinion, I would say absolutely not. Just the mechanics of heating up a large anvil to critical temperature and then quenching it in some medium is just phenomenal. Uh, I would think the cost of running a furnace for that length of time would really just outweigh the benefits of it. And secondly, you don't know exactly what that metal composition is. So if you have a, say you have a wrought iron anvil with a steel face and you want to harden that face, well quenching that anvil could create enough stress to simply pop that steel plate right off of the face of that anvil. They, they simply just were not designed to do that. And if you don't know what the composition of that metal is or the integrity of that anvil, you could be doing a lot more damage than you could possibly repair. So in my opinion, if you have an anvil and you need to weld it to repair it, or you want to grind it down or you want to try to improve the performance by hardening the face, you know, do not try to retemper it. You know, the the risk of damaging that anvil is just so great it isn't worth it and as I've shown you're not increasing the performance you're just increasing the durability so just accept that you have an anvil with a slightly softer face and learn to work around it because the reality is for most people a hardened face just allows them to be more careless around an anvil and that promotes poor technique and is certainly no way to improve your smithing 
Hi, I'm Dennis, and thanks for watching. If you like this video, by all means, give it a thumbs up. If you want to support this channel, you have a couple of options to do that. The first, of course, is to just subscribe. Secondly, if you have any suggestions or photographs of things you'd like to see on this channel, send them along and I'll do my best to turn them into a video. If you want to lend your financial support, you can do that in a couple of ways. First, if you're interested in making an ongoing contribution to this channel, just click the Patreon icon and it'll take you to my Patreon page and you can donate whatever amount you feel comfortable with. If you want to make a one-time contribution, just go to my channel homepage and click the donate button in the banner. So thank you for your support and with your help I'll be doing this for some time to come. I'll see you next time.